and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to cover the uh, agronomy and sustainability work that uh, we do for uh, on our with our checkoff programs, as well as hit on some of the um, sustainability or climate uh, uh, legislation that we see both at the state and federal level. Are we ready to go, Rachel? Again, thanks for joining us. Um, we just go over the agenda. We uh, today's uh, sponsor is FMC, a uh, great sponsor that we have, uh, the uh, good partner of ours, and we'll we'll hear updates uh, from them throughout the, throughout the meeting. And uh, my name's Steve Howe, Senior Director of Industry Affairs for uh, for both corn and soy. Uh, I'll provide a, a policy update again at the federal level as well as state level. And then we'll be hearing a sustainability update from Allie Wells, Director of, of Production and Environment. And then we'll get a little uh, update on, on membership. It's really important to have, have our members engaged in this, in this process. Uh, we couldn't do this work, uh, the policy work without, without members and without our corporate partners. So we'll be uh, hearing a little bit about membership and then uh, Courtney King, our uh, CEO will be wrapping up today's session. So just a little housekeeping, we do have the Q&A feature uh, open. Uh, so at the lower part of your screen, you can ask a question. We'll answer those as we, as we receive them or um, as, as we gather those, we'll try to address those questions. And then if, if it's a type of question that we really can't get to today, we'll certainly have staff uh, review that and get response back to you. And if you can't hear the computer audio, try switching to the phone audio and calling in. A lot of times that uh, the computer audio is not working. So feel free to, to join by phone as well as the computer. Again, uh, today's sponsor is FMC, a great, great partner of ours here. And we do have a sponsorship message uh, from FMC. My name is Jay Harper, and we farm in Lake and Newton counties here in Indiana. One reason why we decided to, to try the Zyway, just cost savings. Margins are tight for everybody. You know, just If we're going to spend the money, you know, we want to get the most benefit out of our money and what we're doing. And it just seems like with this in-furrow Zyway, the fungicide, and having that all season, all, uh, you know, control throughout the season, feels like we're getting the most for our money that we're spending by using that product. When they checked the Zyway plot, when Dan showed me a picture of the roots, the difference in roots just from the check versus the Zyway, and you know, just the roots were so much bigger and looked a lot better than the untreated uh, part of the plot, just to lead to a healthier stalk and just being able to get all the nutrients that are there available to that plant, you know, and uh, Standability, stand better, rooted deeper, better brace roots, you know, throughout the season when that stalk grows and just uh, just a healthier plant. Well, that plant is it's taking everything up, you know, through the roots and uh, when it needs it, you know, OK, if I want a field sprayed, but, you know, the, the airplane can't get there for another 10 days, you know, what, what am I losing, you know, that route too. So I think there's a lot of benefit to it, having it in for all like that. It's there when it, when it needs it. So I'll go over some of the uh, the issues that we're covering uh, with our policy organizations, both the Indiana Soybean Alliance membership and policy committee, as well as the Indiana Corn Growers Association. Just give you a little bit of update in the sustainability and carbon uh, work that or space that we're, we're seeing a lot of activity. And I think, uh, you know, it, um, the whole idea of the carbon, the carbon markets is really, um, taken off here in the in the past um, couple of years really we haven't really seen a lot of work in that space uh, but with the change of the administration 
and um, at the federal level and just more of a focus on climate. Uh, I think it's uh, prudent for us to get our arms around what all this means. And, um, and there, there has been efforts at the, at the state level to address um, uh, the carbon issue as well as um, the US Congress. As uh, many of you know, there was a Growing Climate Solutions Act uh, offered last year, as well as others uh, that we'll, be see, uh, we'll see develop over the next few months. And then what, uh, what space does, uh, or what role does USDA play in all this? Do, can they adjust programs, develop their own programs with their current authority uh, to, um, uh, to provide uh, some, uh, some climate uh, programs? offered through their agency. And then we'll just touch on a little bit of the, on what we see in the uh, private uh, projects, the companies that are getting involved in this, this effort. Well, this year in the Indiana General Assembly, we saw the introduction of um, Senate Bill 373 by Senator Sue Glick. Um, this is a, is really a, a kind of a broad reaching uh, bill uh, that would provide um, the Indiana State Forest, uh, which have managed through the uh, Benjamin Harrison Trust, or, or the state forest managed by the um, Department of Natural Resources. Um, the proposal would, would actually offer a, a way that uh, DNR could take those acres that are in the state forest and uh, receive some type of carbon credit uh, for the carbon that's captured in those uh, in those acres of state forest, and it would also uh, the bill would also enable the uh, state department of agriculture to develop a, uh, some type of program uh, for cropland. In the bill, when it was heard in committee uh, last last month, that did receive uh, widespread support. Uh, many stakeholder groups uh, testified in support of that. Um, both corn and soybean did testify in support of that concept. And, um, but as the conversations um, moved along surrounding this bill, there was a lot of concern about or is the, um, are either the agencies uh, equipped and prepared to, to administer the, the programs as presented in the, this bill. And it was determined that a lot, of, a lot more work was, was needed. And um, there could be, uh, an amendment uh, to the bill uh, to um, send this topic to a, a working group. Now that working group, we certainly want uh, agriculture around the table. We want the technical experts. Uh, we don't know exactly what that would look like yet, uh, but rest assured that we'll be engaged at some level in that working group to make sure that uh, the farmer's concerns are heard. And it's really about what what's the proper role for state government to play in this space? Um, you know, it's, you know, we really don't need the um, state government um, providing that market uh, for, for carbon, uh, but can they be a clearinghouse? Can, you know, just what role can they, are they best suited to provide? Because frankly, if there's a market, you know, farmers will go find that, the market providers will find, find the farmers if, if there's a true market that exists. Uh, but what what's the best role that uh, state government can play uh, in the carbon credit programs? And last year, the, as I mentioned, the Growing Climate Solutions Act was introduced by Senator Braun and Senator Stabenow, and it did receive a, a committee hearing, which is a good sign. If a, if a bill does receive a committee hearing, that suggests that there's a lot of interest in seeing that that concept move forward. And we fully expect that um, it'll be reintroduced this year, both in the Senate and, and the House. Uh, there was a companion bill in the House last, last year. We fully expect that uh, to happen again this year, particularly given uh, the interest in uh, addressing uh, carbon issues. Uh, the purpose of the bill would create a technical assistance program for voluntary carbon credit markets. And I think the key there is voluntary. Uh, we, we support this effort, but it's got to be a voluntary program. Uh, create a certification program to help technical 
uh, help with technical barriers to entry and provide reliable information about carbon markets and provide access to qualified technical assistance providers and credit um, protocol uh, verifiers. And kind of kind of the backstory on um, on this, and I'd welcome uh, Courtney, Allie, or Rachel to, to chime in, uh, but we're, we wanna make sure that whatever uh, programs are out there actually, um, that the farmers get paid for the results, not so much the, uh, the processes or the, the tactics, uh, but we wanna have measurable results that whatever you're doing on your land is actually um, capturing carbon and, and, uh, and that's measurable and that's, that can be verified. Um, so what, what this bill would, would help do is just provide that technical assistance to the, to the farmers uh, so they can participate in a carbon, carbon market. It's not establishing a carbon market, it's just providing that um, technical assistance. So any thoughts, Courtney or Rachel? Yeah, Steve, thank you. Um, it's really about because there are so many different practices and so many different ways that farmers across a variety of crops grow their crops that we're not looking to legislate which practices necessarily or the process by which the carbon is captured, but a way uh, to really enable the outcomes and focus on the outcomes of that. So that's easy to say, but um, tough to do uh, in some of these ways. So it's really about working on those technical barriers, reducing those technical barriers and creating common language and common technicalities by which the carbon markets are all trading. Um, I like to use the analogy of, um, you know, you guys grow and trade number one yellow soybeans or number two yellow corn don't necessarily dictate how you grow them. And that's how I could potentially see the carbon markets getting that um, really become outcome output focused, but we're just not quite there yet. So it's, it's gonna be a process. Allie, anything to add to that? No, I think that that was well said and, and well summarized. I think it's also important to note that the, the certifications for the technical assistance providers are intended to create a level of certainty and reliability. So when a farmer is exploring getting into carbon credit, carbon sequestration and carbon credit, credit production uh, and selling, they can find a technical assistance provider and very simply say, are you USDA certified? That creates a level of trust and a level of familiarity with the process, uh, regardless of, of how you feel about all the processes um, that we're familiar with. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, again, this is a very new um, new market, so we're we're all learning uh, what the what the variables are, and that's uh, what this bill would uh, would help uh, help that that verification process. Uh, again, what uh, what can the USDA uh, do in this space? And it's been very obvious that the Biden administration is going to um, put a lot of emphasis on climate policy. And I really think that uh, almost any issue that you, that will be considered and discussed, there's going to be a climate angle of some type around that. And again, this is just shortly after uh, Secretary Vilsack was confirmed and took uh, took his role back at USDA, and we certainly support having him back there. He's um, he was good to work with when he was there under the Obama administration. But uh, you know, th this just tells us that it's it's going to be um, uh, this quote: um, the conservation e efforts are going to be uh, a big a big push by his um, his uh, as, as his role as Secretary of Agriculture. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it is what it is. And we need to figure out uh, what uh, kind of programs that those uh, there may be, what that looks like, and how can farmers best position themselves to take advantage 
of, of those programs. But again, just highlights the um, the importance that this administration is putting on climate policy. As far as a carbon bank, uh, no details on that yet. Uh, there's been some talk about that, but it's really too soon to to really uh, discuss that. But it's a, a concept that he's thrown out. Next slide, please. And again, we just want to mention there are private pro uh, projects out there. There's a company called Indigo that does have some Indiana farmers uh, enrolled in their programs. There's uh, some of those pilot projects. There's not a great number of those out there yet, or not a great number of farmers participating. Um, but uh, again, as, as uh, from both the policy uh, work that we do, as well as the checkoff work, we want to uh, just understand what um, what companies are out there doing what, and uh, just to be aware of um, of their efforts. And I know there's some good companies that are wanting to get involved in this uh, these efforts, and we're, we're going to continue to watch those. And there's a nonprofit group, the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium. Um, the American Soybean Association is a part of that group, and that's um, uh, again, just want to raise the awareness uh, that uh, the, the private groups are out there as well. Don't know if I have any more slides. Oh, yes. Uh, if you do have, again, this is a fast growing area of interest. And the best information we can receive is what our farmers are hearing and what your perspective is on all this. Um, again, uh, you know, we, there's a there's a lot about this we don't know, uh, but the best information we can receive is from our farmers and what and our members and what what they're hearing, and that'll help us develop either checkoff programs to to meet those those needs or perhaps there's uh, policy efforts that we need to pursue um, with the the interests of the farmer in mind. So we we do need to hear uh, kind of what you're hearing, what your thoughts are, well, how does your farm uh, fit into to this, what do you need on your farm uh, to either participate in a in, in a market, or what what kind of information do you need uh, to help you meet your sustainability goals and uh, participate potentially in a in a credit uh, carbon credit market? So, feel free to reach out to me at at any time to uh, let me know what you're hearing in this space. That wraps up my portion of this. We've got a message from FMC again. Uh, so we'll hear from FMC again, the, the sponsor of today's event, and um, then we'll bring on Allie for her checkoff update. My whole goal in the last 25 or basically 30 years I've been in the business is um, making sure that the, the customer has the tools that he needs and also gets return on investment so he can be here next year. The potential for Zyway protection through the whole season is excellent. I love it, you know, from top to bottom. No scheduling of airplanes, not an additional cost there. Plus we get um, nice benefits with yield, you know. We don't have to go back in and scout every acre. We just know it's got protection all the way through black layer, basically. Walking through the plot several times this spring and um, this summer, we saw a great, great control of gray leaf spot early. It was really, really nice to see that. And it was definitely a huge difference between the untreated check and the Zyway plot. Bigger leaves, darker green in the Zyway, a lot less gray leaf spot lesions. The ear is excellent. We got a lot of rows around. Very, very heavy ear. And we got a few more weeks to finish it out. But um, the tip back is minimal with the weather we've had this year. And it looks like a really, really nice ear. Um, Jay had planted at 32,000, 34,000 population, so this will definitely um, fill up the grain tank. What a better way to protect the yield for a customer than to put it in furrow and have an all season long control of fungicide. We don't have to worry about timing of airplanes. The ease of application is so, so smooth with Zyway. I think as this opens up a brand new door for, for customers, farmers that don't use anything yet. It's just a great, great tool to put on planters and 
make them bushels. It's so easy to use. You do it at planting time. It's gonna be great for the whole farming community to um, get more bushels as we progress in the, you know, in the future here. As we're, we're having this conversation around, um, around climate resiliency and um, different companies and, and policy leaders are, are talking about carbon and other, and other practices being um, kind of a, a solution to, to those uh, growing issues, I wanted to give an update on what uh, we're doing with farmers corn and soybean checkoff dollars uh, to help increase resiliency on and off the farm. Um, and, and invest in, in this conversation around uh, climate resiliency. So first, um, I thought it would be helpful to give an overview of, of what the checkoffs are, are working on as a whole, kind of big picture. Um, one of the, the top focus areas for both organizations is continues to be market development. So working to accelerate and maintain demand for corn and soybean um, and their value added products. The second area um, is this area of sustainability, and both organizations have um, agreed around this definition where sustainability has to be a three-legged stool that includes environmental, community, and economic components. Also focusing on value creation, so increasing the value of corn and soybeans by finding new markets and new uses uh, for, for the corn and soybeans. And then producer engagement. Um, engaging more with farmers to, to share uh, the return on these investments and, and offer programs and resources um, to help farmers succeed. And so for this presentation, I'll, I'll focus on um, the sustainability aspect, but all of these are, are really closely integrated when we, when we talk about um, this, this topic and, and growing conversations around climate resiliency for agriculture. So for sustainability, we've got three objectives that, that we're working on. One is to continue increasing the number of acres in Indiana utilizing environmentally and economically sustainable production practices. Also supporting efforts that reduce production and input costs and improve on-farm profitability. And then increasing community awareness around agriculture and its economic value to the community. So very intentionally focusing on offering programs and resources that fall within each of those three legs to this, this sustainability stool. And so I, I wanna go into details on, on some of these programs, but think that it's helpful um, to also give some context through organizations that we're involved with and conversations um, that we're seeing very closely aligned with throughout the, the entire corn and soybean value chain. And some of these conversations are originating through a group called Field to Market. It's an alliance for sustainable agriculture that convenes members um, that include grower organizations, agribusiness, brands and retail, um, civil society, which would include um, like a, an NGO, like the Nature Conservancy or Environmental Defense Fund, and then also affiliate members um, who include universities and departments of agriculture, um, uh, USDA and RCS, for example. Um, got a screenshot here showing you there are hundreds of members all the way through, through the value chain, um, including some, some big names there, of course, like McDonald's, Kellogg's, Targets. You also see your grower organizations, um, state and national um, input providers. I mean, really there's the whole spectrum and what these groups are doing are having these conversations around what makes sense as we're, as we're hearing from consumers, um, what really makes sense in, in measuring the impacts of the different inputs on our value chain. So for example, um, we're probably noticing a lot from, from a lot of these brands, um, rhetoric around uh, responsible sourcing, nurturing our planet, regenerative agriculture is, is a big phrase. Um, and of course, just the term sustainability. And these are um, both direct to consumer products that use corn and soybean um, ingredients uh, like vegetable oil, corn syrup, also um, really growing in importance for the meat industry, um, which is uh, corn and soybeans number one customer would be livestock feed. 
And then there are also conversations um, around fuel and, and producing a low car carbon fuel and, and how um, that could be one solution to these conversations around climate. And so what, what we're learning through these um, collaborative discussions and research uh, facilitated by Field to Market is that consumers are, are changing their tastes both globally and domestically um, and consider sustainability as a really important factor in their buying decisions. For example, more than eight in 10 global consumers feel that companies should implement programs that implement the environment. When you look at, at groups of consumers, millennials, who um, it's time to get, get out of your head that millennials are the, the entitled college age kids. We are now um, parents and making purchasing decisions for, for families. So think about your 23 to 38 year old consumers. Um, research is showing that, that that group is voting with their wallets. Um, as high as nine out of 10 millennials are willing to pay for more environmentally friendly products. And then the generation directly below that, Gen Z, is increasingly becoming the most conscious consumer with nearly three-fourths identifying that doing their part to make the world a better place um, directly directs their, uh, their buying behavior. And so also when you think of a global perspective, we've got the, the middle class is growing 50 to 70% in the middle class. And that leads to purchasing more protein rich foods, which again is, is really important to think about from the corn and soybean perspective when you think about our, our number one customers. And so again, through this lens of field to market, that's convening um, this group of stakeholders to think about metrics um, that when you get down to the farm level, when they're sourcing their ingredients, these are the metrics that, that are important to consumers that we are, are tracking and benchmarking. And those include biodiversity, energy use, greenhouse gases, irrigation use, land use, soil carbon, soil conservation, and water quality. In addition to, so, right, we're thinking about um, what all of these brands um, and consumer products are, are thinking about. Um, taking that into perspective, we are also as checkoffs working with uh, some national groups and trade associations that are, are hearing um, directly from their customers as well. So the United Soybean Export Council has for several years had a US sustainability assurance protocol that demonstrates the, the sustainability of US soybeans for those export markets for, for other countries purchasing our soybeans. Um, the US Grains Council, which would be the kind of corn counterpart, um, is also hearing that from, from a few of their customers in other countries, um, is currently working on um, developing a similar protocol for, for corn. And then our, our national organizations, the United Soybean Board and National Corn Growers Associations, are um, at the same time aligning with those um, international sustainability protocols, looking at domestic goals for, for corn and soybean growers um, so, that, so that we have a, a message to give to our customers, um, for example, the, the pork industry or the ethanol industry to demonstrate how their supply chain um, is, is sustainable. And so as your state corn and soybean checkoff organization, um, we're engaging in those conversations and developing some boots on the ground programs and resources um, for farmers um, to, to try practices that, that are helpful to meeting some of these goals um, and that also at the same time can help increase um, carbon sequestration and um, improve resiliency against extreme or, or changing weather patterns. So when you take it down to the state level, um, also it's it's not just the, the consumer side and, and the market side that's, that's focusing on sustainability. We also have uh, responsibilities to, um, to our, our state and federal um, governments as they have requirements around nutrient loss reduction to water. Um, for example. And so one, one thing that Indiana corn and soybean did was um, found, along with many others in the state, found the organization called the Indiana Ag Nutrient Alliance to create state level goals around practices um, that can help um, increase resiliency on the farm. And so these, the idea here is to be proactive um, with nutrient management and soil health practices to improve farm viability and reduce nutrient loss to water. The, pra the um, practices that these goals are based around are also um, very beneficial to, to increasing 
carbon on the farm. And so all of those goals are, are aligning. And um, the, the idea here is to work together as a state to facilitate these resources and information so that farmers have tools to maximize productivity. Um, so let's get down to it then. What are these tools and resources? Uh, so back to that first objective of increasing the number of sustainable production practices. Uh, there are a few programs I, I wanted to highlight in particular that are being offered through your checkoff organization. Um, we offer programs both at the watershed level, so more kind of local within your counties, um, but then also some statewide programs as well. So one example um, of a program that fits pretty nicely within both the ideas behind Field to Market and the Indiana Ag Nutrient Alliance is the Upper White Cover Crop Program. This is offered in 16 counties in, in central and east central Indiana. That's an introduction to, to management and benefits of cover crops. So um, it's an opportunity for, for farmers who've never tried cover crops or haven't quite figured out how to make that or if it works on their farm to, to try um, kind of a low risk opportunity there. Uh, 40 acres um, offered to aerial apply a winter kill cover crop mix your, your first year, could also plan it yourself, um, but we do offer the aerial application um, that we ask participants to consider being in the program for, for three to five years and the cover crop mix alternates depending on where you are in your corn and soybean rotation after that first year. Um, biomass sampling, soil sampling, and peer group meetings are off, also all offered to uh, participants of the program. And this is something that um, we've been able to offer both through checkoff funds, support from Bex Hybrids, Cargill and a grant from the Walton Family Foundation. Um, and so think about you know, who our partners here are and, and what their interests might be. And that goes back to you know, what are the consumer interests? What are the customer interests? So we're able through this program to aggregate the impacts that we're having on uh, water quality, carbon and, and greenhouse gas um, by using models with our State Department of Agriculture, verifying it with the Nature Conservancy. All aggregate impacts of this program, no individual pharma da farmer data shared. And then that's something each of these organizations that are involved can, can use um, to tell a story um, for on-farm sustainability. Outside of individual watershed programs, we also have a, a statewide um, farm network of on-farm trials. So these are, are also um, kind of low impact split field trials. Um, farmers can choose from uh, cover crops, a nitrogen timing trial, or a reduced tillage trial. Um, we offer access to an online benchmarking tool called Truterra, um, where you can evaluate economic and environmental impacts um, being made through these trials, also offer soil tests and soil health assessments. Um, and as this is offered um, through a USDA conservation innovation grant, grant there's a financial incentive to, to signing up um, for this program as well. And so um, this program is a, currently open in enrollment for all three trials. Um, the nitrogen trial will close up pretty soon, but um, we'll, be, we'll be enrolling farmers for the cover crop and reduced tillage trials through this summer. So if there's something that interests you or, or you think a, a neighbor might be interested in learning about, um, you can learn more on infieldadvantage.org. Um, also wanted to quickly get into the other pillars of this three-legged stool. So supporting efforts that reduce production and input costs and improve on-farm profitability. Um, the largest investments that you'll see there currently will be in university research, um, focusing the mission on um, investing in practices or breeding technology that um, have both environmental and economic benefits for farmers. Both checkoff organizations have invested in the Corn and Soybean Innovation Center at Purdue. So this is a, a phenotyping center that um, encourages kind of cross-sector collaboration and, and innovation um, around growing crops, um, um, addressing um, concerns with extreme weather patterns um, such, as, such as drought or, or too much rain. Um, 
And so in addition to investing in the actual establishment of this, cen this center, um, there are also research endowments, according to being research endowments to ensure that research is being done specifically um, for those uh, crops. And then also um, working with other partners such as Agrinovis to, um, to fund other inno innovative ideas such as through the Ag Tech Innovation Challenge, um, staying current um, with, with the activity going on with the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem service markets. And um, you know, as Steve said, listening and talking with farmers to, to determine what resources would be most helpful to farmers as, as you're potentially being approached by those companies, um, just different you know, questions consider before entering those con contracts. And so those are all activities that, that are being funded through, through this um, economic um, leg of the stool. Additionally, um, we invest in making sure there's support as you're trying out new, um, new practices. Um, don't wanna just leave farmers hanging. And so um, encourage um, interaction with, with these two um, important groups and the Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative. Um, the, the farmers in, in this program have been doing many soil health practices for many, many years, um, cover crops, reduced tillage, some edge of field practices, and they have, um, they're willing to share um, kind of their financials and what they've learned, their, um, their, you know, things that they've tried, trial and error is the term I'm looking for there. And so they have webinars and, and workshops that, um, that you can engage with and, and maybe find someone in, in your area um, to learn from. Um, also the Soil Health Partnership, which um, originated out of the National Corn Growers Association has a network of 20 farms in Indiana that have been trying some of these practices for five years um, through replicated strip trials. And so um, they ha also have economic data um, and some trial and error stories to share. And so um, host field days and, and webinars and offer engagement with that network on soilhealthpartnership.org. And then I'll just close this out real quickly on this update. Um, would be remiss with, without mentioning the social component. Um, farmers are doing a lot in this space already that, that many people don't even know about, consumers, policy leaders, et cetera. And so making sure that, that we're, as we're you know, collecting this aggregate data, we're sharing it with the larger community. Um, and that's being done through avenues such as the Glass Barn at the State Fair, um, working with the Colts, the Children's Museum, Fair Oaks Farms, and then also um, on the ground outreach to local community leaders. I'm um, just educating on, on what farmers are doing in this space and, and what are the impacts to your local community um, and, and globally. And so with that, I will close out my checkoff update on sustainability. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Not seeing any questions right now. Rachel, do you do we have any questions right now? Not that uh, I see, so go ahead. Yeah, that, I think what uh, is, you know, as I, as I listen to the presentation, I think what's key is that you know, when we talk about sustainability, it does have to be economic sustain, sustainable as well. Um, because if you're not profitable in your farm, it's, uh, you know, you can't adopt uh, new technology to, uh, to reach the, you know, maybe the environmental sustainability goals that you have. So anything that, uh, that you do on the farm has, you know, you have to consider that economic sustainability along with the environmental sustainability. I believe maybe we have, what's the next slide, Rachel? I've kind of lost my place here. No, oh, you're fine. This one. What's yeah. that? I said, no, you're fine. I was just gonna run through the upcoming okay. events uh, for if the remainder. That, yeah, for the remainder of March, we're going to have a webinar series uh, every Tuesday next week. We're gonna have Ed Ebert on to give a market update. He's been much happier for the last few months. So it's always nice to have upbeat, optimistic Ed on our webinars. And then on the 
30th. Uh, we have not finalized our topic yet. Uh, I wish we had gotten it done by today, but we have not yet. We'll be meeting with those folks later. So I'm very excited to reveal to you later on what the webinar on the 30th will be, but I hope you register for both the events for the rest of this month. Uh, Macy will be sending out emails in the coming days. As I mentioned before, the, you know, the policy work that we do, we cannot do that uh, without your membership. Uh, it's very important for farmers to be, uh, be members of both uh, Indiana Corn Growers Association as well as the membership and policy uh, work that um, uh, Soybean Alliance does. Uh, to accomplish this, uh, we've got uh, a great deal on the a joint membership, so you can be a member of both ISA and ICGA for $150 a year. And that, that also provides you membership into the national groups, American Soybean Association, as well as the National Corn Growers Association. So you get the benefit of really all four organizations for that, that one price of $150. And again, you know, it's just a small investment uh, to make sure that the policy work is covered on your behalf, uh, to make sure that the farmers have a voice at the state house as well as uh, in Washington. So that's, a, you know, it's always an ask of ours, but, you know, we just can't do that, uh, do that work without your membership. And uh, also we need your voice at times uh, to make sure that that farmer story is being told. How does your, uh, how does it, you know, how does a particular issue affect your farm in that member's district? That's the most powerful tool we have is the farmer story about how how a policy will impact, how, how policy direct, directly impacts uh, your farm. So uh, to do that, you have to be a member and we do appreciate the members that we have. If you're not a member, please consider joining. We'll be sending in information out uh, to you, uh, asking you to join. Next slide. Courtney. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Allie and Rachel. Great information. So as Steve mentioned, the membership is so important because we can't use checkoff dollars for advocacy and lobbying. So it's so, so important to have that, that membership and your membership support and support of our great sponsors uh, like the folks of FMC today. So thank you to our members and thank you to our sponsors for your support. And on the policy side, you heard two updates from Steve about carbon legislation. And this is getting a lot of interest and information at the state and federal level. So as you're continuing to hear that, or if anyone hears of anything, please reach out to Steve. His contact information was on here. But we'd love to hear from you and hear um, how you think that legislation may impact you and the decisions on your farm. As Steve said, your stories are the most important stories that we can share with our legislators. So hearing from you and how you think that legislation may impact you is what we, we love to do. Also then you heard from Allie and talking about the strategic plan that the corn and soybean farmers developed and approved in August and really doing the work of checkoff in those four strategic focus areas, market development, sustainability, value creation, and producer engagement. And thanks to Ali's insights, we were able to do a little bit of a deep dive into the sustainability, that three-legged stool between environmental, uh, community, and economic sustainability. And it really does take all three legs to make a difference and we know to be important not only for yourselves, but then also for the customers and the entire supply chain. It was really interesting when Allie was sharing with me um, the consumers and how they're really pulling through the supply chain by their buying behaviors and their uh, voting with their wallet, so to speak, and their purchasing decisions. And that's impacting then the brands and their so sourcing decisions, both domestically you saw some of those domestic brands and what NCGA and USB is doing, but then also internationally in the international marketplaces and the work through a US Soybean Export Council and US Grains Council on the export market. But all of that really comes back to those local decisions and the local um, work that we're doing here within the state, working with partners like IANA, with Bex, with Cargill, and it's that local work. So it really does all start with the decisions that you guys are making locally, the work that you're doing locally, and then the impact that has on that, and then it continues to flow through the value chain. 
So thank you for the decisions and the work that you're doing locally as well, and for continuing to support through your membership uh, and again, through our sponsors. And with that, Rachel, I think we've got one more message from our sponsor. So again, thank you to FNC for their sponsorship today. We really appreciate it. Um, and then once we're done with the sponsorship, we hope that you guys have a great afternoon uh, and be safe out there. Thank you. The thing that most interested us about Zyway was the ability to apply a season-long fungicide at planting. The biggest advantage to having a fungicide is it controls the diseases that we're concerned with. It gives you some plant health and ultimately that transpires into a higher yield at the end of the day. On the acres that we use Zyway this year, it's a very big relief to know that we don't have to make another fungicide application. It's already there and we don't have to go back and retreat. If you're interested in a product that you can put down in furrow at planting time and complete your fungicide application, then Zyway is the product for you. There's no need for additional custom fees and application or buying a big sprayer to get over corn at tassel. When you get through planting, you walk away from the field and your fungicide is there. <music>